Good afternoon, good morning. Thanks for joining us here at Town Meeting TV. I'm so happy to be here with Stephanie Yu, who is the new Executive Director of Public Assets Institute. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. The last time that we talked, you were, um, we were conversing about in your role as a researcher and basically one of the leads on the reports that Public Assets puts out that informs your legislative agenda and hopefully creates more equitable Vermont. Yep. I think I summed that up, right? That was pretty good, yep. But now you're the executive director and you have followed the longtime founder, Paul Sillo, and congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And technically it starts Jan January 1st, but I'll take it, yep. Okay, yeah, good. For all intents and purposes, yep. And um, why were you excited to take up this role as ED? It's a big job. There's no question that it's a big job, but you know, I've been with public assets for seven years now and it's it's really rewarding work. I mean, we're really thinking about, as you said, how to make a more equitable, equitable Vermont. I've got lots of ideas. Um, and it's been really great to have been working with Paul for seven years and really have a sense of where we're going. And our board and staff are amazing. We have a great team. Sometimes it's hard work, but I'm excited about different directions we can take it and also to sort of keep our core work going. And why don't you just recap the core work so folks Remember. Yeah. So a lot of what we, we work on is state budget related stuff. Um, so that includes sort of state level policy about family economic security in particular. So wage laws, also benefit, you know, benefit programs, that kind of thing. But then we also do a lot of work on education funding, which is a big part, you know, it's the biggest job that the state does. So that's a big piece of it too. Um, yeah, so those are kind of our big areas, you know, and then other public policy issues as they come up. Um, it, you know, it can vary from year to year. Some years, last year was a big year for education funding. Sometimes, you know, we've been involved in the family leave conversation, minimum wage, can be a range. And so you've recently, or about to publish your State of Working Vermont, is that the right title? Yep, I think it came out, yep. Yeah. And it came out Just this week? week. Mm -hmm. So tell us what the key findings are. So really what we wanted to look at in this report was to think about um, what the pre-pandemic baseline was, what worked in terms of government interventions during the pandemic, and then where we are now. And so really what we're, what we're looking at is, this, is that going back to the pre-pandemic normal isn't a great idea because there were a lot of people struggling to get by then. Some of our government interventions worked really well. We saw them work. Housing, cash in people's pockets, food aid, all of that stuff really worked well. And then we kind of pulled the rug out. So, you know, how do we keep some of those programs going or restart them as the case may be for some of these things and really sort of making sure that we have a state where everybody can thrive and really thinking about what we, what we owe to each other collectively, what, what does it look like to make sure that everybody has what they need, which I think was really kind of the the spirit that the pandemic awakened. So one of the things that I've noticed is an increase in wages across the state. Does your report see that or is that just anecdotal? No, there's definitely been some, some increases in wages. As you know, inflation has sort of eroded some of those actual increases, some of the real spending power there. But part of, it's sort of a, a journey across the pandemic. You know, in the first year, so many low wage jobs got shut down that that sort of appeared like a wage increase but wasn't really real. And then in 2021, it looks like there's definitely competition for workers. So we've definitely seen wages grow up, go up in a real way. But again, with inflation where it is, how much, whether people are better off in terms of spending hours sort of depends on the job, depends on the sector, depends on your situation. And then what about the great resignation, this discussion about where are all the workers? This is a great question. It's not one that we can really answer definitively. I think we can say that there's a couple of factors going on. So the first thing to know is that labor force participation. So the share of working age people that are in the labor force, either employed or looking for work, is at its lowest level in more than 40 years, as long as we've been keeping track pretty much. So, and that cuts differently across age groups, it cuts differently, differently across education, but, it's, but overall it's at its lowest level in four decades. So the question is where are all those people? Is it that wages have gone up enough that people are able to take um, that people who maybe had a second job aren't taking, you know, only have one job now? Or is it, we know that there's a, a section of people who retired early, who maybe it's not ideal financially, but you know, whether it's health considerations, spouses' health considerations, whatever it is, we saw a lot of older people leaving the workforce, um, you know, a lot of sort of early retirements. And so that's definitely a slice of it. There's definitely lower participation among, you know, the 16 to 24, 25 year olds 
which, is, which had been declining before the pandemic, but definitely has gotten worse. So whether those are people who were working while they were in school or doing multiple things, or whether it was people who you know, are able to live at home a little longer or whatever the situation might be, there's a lot of moving parts and there's not one, as we don't have one neat story yet, but I think it's all of these things sort of put together. Well, I remember in 2008, a lot of people that were going to retire didn't, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure they held on for 12 years, mm -hmm. but they may have. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. I remember, at least in the nonprofit sector, there is this real concern about a cliff, right. and in 08, the cliff didn't happen, but I see it happening now among my peers, for example. Mm -hmm. No, we're definitely seeing, uh, you know, among Vermo Vermonters 65 and older that there's been sort of a pretty big drop in labor force participation. Don't know whether that's permanent, certainly could be, um, you know, and it certainly could be health considerations as well. So, and, and I think that, again, the government interventions, the fact that there was some, some cash in people's pocket may have made it a little easier, at least in the beginning, to, to sort of bridge. You know, if you were a year or two out from retirement, now you've got um, a little bit of a bridge, maybe you step it up a little bit. Well, I know that child care has been a, is a big issue in the state, a big issue in the policy agenda, and that there were subsidies for child care for people during the pandemic, and that has been withdrawn largely. Mm -hmm. What are the implications of that shift? So part of what we're noting in the report is that there's a pretty substantial reduction in the number of providers and also a reduction in slots. And in some areas of the state, pretty big reductions in slots, you know, 30, 40 percent of child care you know, slots in child care capacity going down. Some of that is, um, is school programs, some after school programs not being able to find staff or, or there being less demand because for whatever reason, you know, parents keeping kids home more, p parents not wanting kids in multiple sort of exposed in mul multiple settings. Um, so we're not quite sure, but I think, you know, I think there's, there's been a pretty good roadmap in Vermont and some thinking about how to shore up the child care sector and, and thinking about it also as early education, right? Not just, not sort of just child care, but what does pre-K look like? What, how much of this is education? And really thinking about it as more of a collective responsibility rather than a user fee for parents, you know, that the parents are paying for it. And we know that a lot of child care providers are underpaid. So that has also likely contributed to people leaving their jobs when they're, if there's a better paying job somewhere else, you know, it's tough to hold on to people. So I think there's a lot of thinking about good wages, what's the right mix, you know, what is, how does education play a role in all of it, and, you know, what is the right capacity in terms of what people need. So the governor recently came out with a parental leave proposal, if I'm not mistaken, family leave, actually, yes. family leave proposal. Sure. Um, and he had vetoed, I think, the last yep. proposal, and now he has this new one, which is structured differently. Could you comment on what the governor's proposing and your view of whether it's the right way to go? I haven't dug into the details of this particular proposal um, yet, but I will say that my understanding of it is that it's pretty similar to where the governor was a couple of years ago, which was sort of a private version of this and a voluntary version of this. And what the, the Family Leave Coalition and the partners that we've worked with on this have been pretty pretty clear that it needs to be open to everyone and that it needs to be, you know, a collective contribution. So not this voluntary sort of privatized version, but the way that what makes it work is having a lot of people involved in it, sort of like any kind of big pooled situation, you, you know, that's what makes the cost structure work at an affordable rate. And it's pretty clear, I think, that Vermonters are in favor of a big family leave. And I think the pandemic really underscored the importance of having some flexibility in, in, in work time and so, you know, we'll see. So really the question is, how do you finance it? Is it a kind of, like an insurance pool? I mean, that's in effect what the original proposals of the legislature were. Right, a public insurance version, right. Right, mm -hmm. but even that proposal, if I remember correctly, and I'm sorry I'm not being concrete, but um, really didn't go far enough in meeting the needs that families have in terms of subsidizing their time away from the office. Is that right? Well, I will say that, so as I said, there's a family sort of a coalition that's been working on this for a number of years that we've been involved with. And, um, and their position had, and I don't know sort of, I don't know when the last kind of regrouping on this was, but I think, you know, it always started from a, from a more robust place and then the legislature sort of looking at the cost kind of negotiated it down to, you know, whether it was 12 weeks to six weeks, whether, you know, there was some discussion of which family members count, which I think 
great. Uh, good, the good news is I think we've backed off a little bit from that discussion because it really should be up to the people who their family members are that they want to take care of. But, um, but you know, and then how much is the wage replacement? You know, how far to up does that go? What's the, and we'd like to see a really robust system and some states ha have a really robust system. I think, you know, yes, six weeks is better than nothing, but really we're talking about, you know, 12 weeks is, is really the kind of the starting place of what makes sense. Because, you know, whether it's parental leave or whether it's a, some other long-term illness, you know, six weeks goes by pretty fast. So I think, you know, I think that is part of the conversation is really this, ba this balance between cost benefit and, um, you know, what makes sense. But it is very cost effective to do it as this group pool. So whether you go, you know, so 12 weeks I think is a pretty good starting place and we'd certainly like to see, you know, more. We know plenty of countries where it's a year of parental leave or six months at least. So, you know, 12 weeks is I think a pretty reasonable starting place. So what would happen in the legislature this biennium? The, the governor's got a proposal, I imagine, then does the legislature bring their proposal back? How, how does the... How's policy get made now? Right. Well, everything sort of resets in a new biennium, so it's not going to be the same bill, but you know, a lot of the, sort of the same the same concepts will be there. And and over the years, there have been several different versions that have passed one or the other house. So you know, we'll we'll just see where they go. There's definitely been some noise that I think the legislature is pretty committed, legislative leadership pretty committed to a robust family leave package. So you know, we'll we'll sort of see what the process looks like. But you know, I think. We've got a pr pretty good um, groundwork laid for it. And then tell us how public assets research and analysis gets turned into legislation. What's the session look like for you, and what are the priorities, and how do you advance them? I appreciate that question. So, you know, it, it really depends. So this year, there's a couple different pieces that we're working on. Um, one of the biggest pieces is talking about the EITC and the, the, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. So I don't know how well publicized it was, but Vermont passed a child tax credit in the last session. And that's huge. Not that many states have them. It's a big, you know, it's $1,000 for kids under six, um, you know, up to a parent income of a you know, certain level or, or guardian income of a certain level. But, but, you know, it could certainly be bigger. We want to make sure that it gets expanded to as many people. It could be both bigger dollar-wise and who's eligible could be expanded. One of the areas that we're looking at is making sure that um, all families are eligible for that credit. We'd also like to see the earned income tax credit go up. I mean, again, we raised it, the legislature raised it in this last session, um, but there's plenty of room to still grow there. So that's, so that's up there. And also those are, there's sort of an eligibility, you know, who's, who qualifies and who doesn't is part of the conversation, not just the, the amount of it. So those two pieces, um, Again, that's what we saw work during the pandemic. The federal child tax credit was huge for putting money in people's pockets. And we saw positive effects, not just for those families, but you know, across the economy more broadly. Uh, and just really as a great direct way to make sure people have what they need and to kind of you know, keep our economy going. So, so, I, so that's one piece. We're also working with some partners on some, some budget process stuff. I mean, it's a little bit boring, but, um, but a lot of it is, really centering the conversation around what Vermonters need. And I think, unfortunately, what happens in our budget process a lot of the time is that we're kind of looking at, or I'll say the legislature and administration are sort of looking at how much money is coming in and then deciding what they can do. And there really hasn't been a balanced conversation about are we meeting the needs. It's really like these are, these are all the needs we can afford to meet because this is how much money we have, as opposed to a real conversation about do we need more revenue? Do we need different revenue in order to meet these needs? Because these needs are really important. And so, you know, one of the things that we found in our report was that these, these pandemic interventions reduce poverty. You know, it was pretty straightforward. Put money in people's pockets, reduce poverty. It works pretty well. So, you know, are we committed to, keep it, to continuing to do that? So I think that's, so, that, so that's another piece where we want to at least make sure that we're having that conversation and actively making those choices as opposed to starting from this place of we're not raising revenue and we're never going to talk about, you know, what the needs of Vermonters are. You know, and I, you know, to, you know, I want to be fair, the legislature obviously spends a lot of time thinking and talking about the needs of Vermonters, but they're always thinking about how to stay under that cap too. And so I think that's part of the challenge. Um, and I really think, you know, we saw so much community coming together, you know, so much mutual aid, so, you know, sort of the spirit of collective, you know, meeting each other's collective needs together. 
uh, during the pandemic that I think there's a real space to keep that going. So are you concerned about the impact of the government printing massive amounts of money in order to pay for COVID subsidies and its impact on inflation? I mean, is there a connection between all of that? And on the one hand, the COVID subsidies put money in the pockets of people, but on the other hand, the implications, the inflationary pressures um, also are not favorable for people. So how does that economic cycle work and how do you justify spending more and offset the downsides of creating more money? So there's a lot going on with inflation and there's a lot of factors. And of course, you know, when when you see the price of gas go up, when you see the price of food go up, it has real immediate implications for people, especially if wages aren't growing fast enough. But the, the short answer is no, I'm not particularly worried about the government doing too much. I would rather the government do too much and then we figure out the other piece. And a lot of the inflationary pressures are really out of outside Vermont's control. When we looked at the main causes of inflation, this also shows up in our report, it's really energy prices. Energy prices is the biggest jump. So home, home heating, or, you know, fuels as well as gas prices. And those are really things that are happening across the country. It's not particular, across the world, really. War in Ukraine, lots of other factors that are, that are affecting that that we don't have a lot of control over. So I would rather make sure that people have the money that they need and then we figure out what else we can do on these other things. Um, and, and so that's not something that we're overly concerned about. I think that, again, there's a lot of factors that are influence, influencing inflation, some of which, you know, the federal government is trying to do some things about, some of which are out of our control and we're weathering. You know, again, with gas prices, there's been some federal intervention to, to kind of manage that. But, um, but the main thing is making sure that people have what they need. And are you, uh, what's your view? The governor um, talks a lot about the number of people that, that pay taxes versus the number of people that consume services and that he's concerned that there are fewer and fewer people who are contributing to the tax pool and more and more people who are consuming um, subsidies, if you will, that are paid for by those taxes. What's Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He has this mm -hmm. formula and mm -hmm. we're losing two of those people every day. Um, so what's your view on his analysis and how that is, is structured? I think it's the wrong question. I think that I think that what we sh the question we should be asking is why do these people have enough to pay taxes and these people don't have enough to pay taxes in the first place? So I think that's the question. We've certainly seen income inequality on the rise concentrated in the hands. And, and again, the pandemic was a very, we hope, a very unusual situation. And it also highlighted cracks in the system that already existed, right? So, so we knew we had poverty before. We knew that we just weren't keeping up with inflation. We knew hu housing, pr housing prices were unaffordable for a lot of people in the state. So, you know. But why is that the case? Is it wage policy? Is it, you know, it's a combination of all these things. Is it wage policy? Is it historical inequities that value some jobs at, you know, lower than, other, less, less money than other jobs? So I think there's a lot of factors in there. So I think it's not about how many people do we have paying taxes? And, and, and that really sets up this us-them dynamic, which just isn't accurate. I think it's because at any given time, people can use services. You lose your job during the pandemic again. A lot of people lost their jobs and had no control over it. You know, that was the biggest unemployment spike we've ever seen. So, so people are gonna need services. People needed help with food aid. People needed help staying in housing. And it's not, an, it's not a sort of give or take or split. It's that, what does everybody need? What, are, what does everybody need collectively? And in the moments in your life when you lose income for whatever reason or you have certain circumstances, or there's ongoing systemic challenges like we devalue service jobs and care jobs because of historic sex sexism and racism, you know, what do we do about that? So I think there's a lot of ways to really think about this as what is the collective sort of contract we should have with each other and how do we meet that and not about who's paying what and who's not paying what. So the legislature is a pretty much a brand new wave of people, primarily Democratic, um, maybe, you know, veto-proof majorities in there. Interesting. So how do you see, how do you see your agenda in light of the, the new set of legislators? And now you're really the lead lobbyist for public assets. Mm -hmm. 
you have an expanded role. So when you look at this session and you look at this next group of people that you need to build relationships with, what are you thinking? I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, I think, I think, and you know, the whole veto-proof magic number varies from issue to issue, but this is certainly an, a legislature that's interested, I think, in getting things done and, and is certainly more progressive than legislatures that we've seen. And we have this administration who has sort of stifled a lot of these conversations over the last six years. So I think there's a lot of potential for these, the conversations to shift. You know, I have been doing a lot of the work for public assets for the last few years, so it's not totally new. And also I'll say that our main job is not lobbying. Our main job tends to be trying to put good data into the conversation, trying to frame conversations in a way that is fact-based. And, but also, you know, our vision is a state that works for everyone. So we're also working toward that and sort of those are our recommendations. So, you know, I think it is more of the same. I think it's a great opportunity um, in terms of this legislature. I think there's a lot of creative energy and sort of interest in kind of doing some big things. So I'm excited to see to see what happens and to you know hopefully help shape that. And are there any um, any legislation besides what we've talked about that we want to be tracking that you're you're helping legislators make happen and would be worth tracking? So some of the things you know we mentioned is if if we there's some work on EITC if there's um, some work on budget process stuff um, you know I think. It's still sort of we're still sort of in that phase of trying to see what what issues are going to come up. I do think family family leave is going to be a big one. Although I, I'll say you know there are other organizations that are more of the lead on that that um, really know what they're doing. Um, so you know I I don't know that there's anything particular that I would point to. We're always paying attention to the state budget and what's going on there. Um, and some of that has to do with you know as the federal COVID money uh, sort of gets narrower in terms of where it is in the budget and what what we can do with it. Um, I think you know we're talking about is there going to be a cliff and what do we do about that cliff and those pieces. Um, education funding, there's still some conversations going on with that. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes made that haven't been fully implemented in terms of education funding. The pupil waits last year and even the special ed funding of a few years ago, there's still pieces being implemented. So I think we're still keeping an eye on any future changes with education funding too. All right, well, there's a lot ahead, mm -hmm. and congratulations. And I just want to thank you because we um, think really highly of public assets and the work that Paul has done over these years, and the to not just Paul, obviously, but the staff and the board, and it's just great to see you being the leader. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I appreciate it. So we've been speaking with Stephanie Yu. She's the executive director to be on January, well, when you're watching this program, January 2023 of Public Assets Institute. And uh, we're looking forward to the work that you'll be doing to support the legislature this year. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching.